Welcome back to Memorable Neurology. Today we're going over the anatomy of the brainstem. The brainstem acts as a bridge of sorts connecting the brain to the spinal cord and the rest of the body. However, the brainstem is much more than just a bridge, as it has a wide range of functions all its own, many of which we will cover in this video. The brainstem isn't a single homogeneous structure, but instead is split into three parts, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata, sometimes just called the medulla. The midbrain is the uppermost part of the brainstem and receives nerve impulses traveling to and from many of the structures we've talked about in earlier videos. These nerves then continue down the midbrain into the pons and then into the medulla at the bottom before finally exiting the skull as the spinal cord. Each part of the brainstem contains unique nuclei that carry out specific functions. However, the three parts of the brainstem can also work together to perform several larger functions. In particular, all three parts of the brainstem help to maintain consciousness and awareness through a shared group of interconnected nuclei known as the reticular formation. The reticular formation plays a vital role in deciding which sensory signals are sent upwards to the brain for conscious processing and which are considered irrelevant and therefore ignored. For example, someone living in an apartment on a busy city street is still able to sleep through the night despite the barrage of sensory information that this involved, such as the sound of cars passing by or the brightness of the streetlights outside. This is because the reticular formation is helping to filter out irrelevant stimuli and prevent them from breaking the state of unconsciousness. However, if something unexpected happens, such as someone tickling them while asleep, the reticular formation determines that this isn't just the usual background noise and sends the signal into conscious awareness, waking the person up from their sleep. In this way, the reticular formation helps govern which information is consciously processed and which is ignored. And with that, we'll now dive into each of the three parts of the brainstem in more detail, starting with the midbrain. Let's look at the midbrain as if we took a knife and sliced through it from side to side. This produces an image something like this. If you turn it upside down, the cross section kind of looks like a teddy bear's face. We can use this resemblance to describe the relevant neuroanatomy. Let's go ahead and flip the face back to how it was before. The chin of the bear is known as the tectum. The tectum contains two paired structures that are both involved in processing special sensory information. The higher pair, the superior colliculi, are involved in controlling eye movements in response to visual information, while the lower pair, the inferior colliculi, are involved in relaying auditory signals to the thalamus. In the middle is the mouth of the bear, or the central cerebral aqueduct. The cerebral aqueduct contains cerebrospinal fluid and forms part of the ventricular system, or a fluid-filled series of cavities within the brain. Just above the mouth is the mustache of the bear, which is the medial longitudinal fasciculus, another structure that is heavily involved in eye movement. Specifically, the medial longitudinal fasciculus serves as the connection point between the three cranial nerves that control the muscles around the eyes. The bulk of the bear's upper face, roughly where the nose, eyes, and forehead would be, is made up of the tegmentum. The tegmentum contains much of the aforementioned reticular formation as well as sensory fibers traveling from the spinal cord to the thalamus. The area immediately surrounding the cerebral aqueduct is known as the periaqueductal gray and contains a collection of cell bodies that plays an important part in the perception and regulation of pain. The red nucleus is also found in the midbrain. The red nucleus plays a pretty minor role in movement and is not too clinically important. Then, at the base of the ears lies the substantia nigra, which, as you'll recall from a previous video, forms part of the basal ganglia. In fact, it's the only part of the basal ganglia that lies outside of the cerebrum. Finally, the ears of the midbrain, known as the cerebral peduncles, consist largely of motor neurons traveling from the motor cortex to skeletal muscles, known as the corticospinal tract and to the muscles of the face via the cranial nerves, which is known as the corticobulbar tract. Two cranial nerves branch off the midbrain as well, cranial nerve 3, the oculomotor nerve, and cranial nerve 4, the trochlear nerve, both of which are involved in eye movement. To 
To put this all together, you can use the mnemonic IMPRESS, which stands for in the midbrain are the periaqueductal gray, red nucleus, eye movement centers, including the medial longitudinal fasciculus, substantia nigra, and both the superior and inferior colliculi. Moving down from the midbrain, we next hit the pons. Within the pons lies the continuation of the tracts from the midbrain, including the corticospinal tract going to the muscles, and various sensory fibers going to the parietal lobe. However, the pons also contains a few unique structures that perform several vital functions. Let's use the word pons itself to illustrate them. P is for pneumos. The pons contains the pontine respiratory center, which is one of the three areas, the other two being in the medulla, that help to regulate the rate and depth of breathing. The pontine respiratory center is itself made up of two sub-areas. The first is the pneumotaxic center, which stops inspiration when the lungs have stretched too far, while the second is the apneustic center, which helps to promote inspiration when the lungs are empty. Cycling between the pneumotaxic center and the apneustic center creates the usual rhythm of breathing. The O is for ocular movements. Within the pons is the paramedian pontine reticular formation, which is partially responsible for controlling eye movements. Damage here produces a weakness of eye movements known as a gaze palsy. N is for neurotransmitters. The pons contains two major sites of neurotransmitter production. The first is the raphe nucleus, which produces serotonin, a neurotransmitter involved in mood and emotion. The second is the locus ceruleus, which produces norepinephrine, a neurotransmitter that plays a major role in the sympathetic nervous system and its fight or flight response. Finally, the S is for sleep. The pons contains structures important to the aforementioned reticular formation is in particular a major contributor to the sleep cycle. Four more cranial nerves branch off of the pons. Cranial nerve five, the trigeminal nerve, six, the abducens nerve, seven, the facial nerve, and eight, the vestibulocochlear nerve. Finally, the medulla oblongata is the lowest part of the brainstem. Like the midbrain and pons, the tracts carrying motor and sensory information continue here. The medulla also contains several reflex centers, most of which involve either keeping good things in or pushing bad things out. The first, the vomiting reflex, lies in an area known as the area postrema, which initiates this process when it detects a potential toxin in the mouth. You can remember the function of the area postrema by thinking of it as a PO streamer, with PO or per os being common medical jargon for by mouth. The medulla also contains the nucleus solitarius, which receives input from the tongue about taste and is involved in the gag reflex. In addition, the nucleus solitarius is involved in the baroreceptor reflex that regulates blood pressure. Because of its dual function, a lesion at the nucleus solitarius can result in a characteristic combination of loss of taste as well as instability of blood pressure and other vital signs. You can remember this by thinking of it as the nucleus solictarius. Imagine being asked to lick the sole of someone's foot. This would likely make you want to gag and would cause your heart rate and blood pressure to go up. This should remind you that the nucleus solictarius is involved in taste sensation, the gag reflex, and regulation of vital signs. In addition, the medulla oblongata contains the nucleus ambiguous, which connects to the muscles involved with speech and swallowing. Damage to the nucleus ambiguous can lead to dysphagia, or difficulty chewing, dysarthria, or trouble speaking, and dysphonia, or a hoarse voice. You can remember the function of the nucleus ambig uh -uhs by pronouncing it with two uhs at the end, which should help remind you of someone giving a speech who keeps saying lots of uhs. Vitally, the cardiovascular center and the rest of the respiratory center both lie within the medulla. You can remember these core functions of the medulla oblongata by thinking of someone getting a medal pinned onto them as a reward. The medulla goes right over their heart and lungs. Like the other parts of the brainstem, the medulla shoots off a few cranial nerves of its own. Cranial nerve 9, the glossopharyngeal nerve, 10, the vagus nerve, 11, the spinal accessory nerve, and 12, the hypoglossal nerve. 
Finally, at the end of the medulla, the pyramidal decussation occurs. This is a crucial part of understanding the motor pathway, so pay close attention here. At the pyramidal decussation, the nerve fibers in the motor pathway cross over from left to right and right to left. This is the reason why damage to the left side of the brain produces weakness on the right side of the body, and vice versa. Efferent motor pathways are not the only ones that decussate in the medulla. Some, but not all, sensory tracts also cross here. We'll discuss this further in a future video on the spinal cord. To remember the unique functions of the medulla, use the mnemonic SCARF, which stands for the nucleus solitarius, the crossing of the motor and sensory pathways, the nucleus ambiguous, the respiratory center, the area postrema, and control over the heart through the cardiovascular center. The medulla is the part of the brainstem that is closest to the neck, which is where you'd wear a scarf, which should help you connect this mnemonic to the medulla. After the medulla, the brainstem as we know it ends and the spinal cord officially begins. This means that we have officially crossed the bridge from the brain to the spinal cord. Come back to see the next video where we will cover the spinal cord in more detail. As always, thanks for watching. If you've been enjoying the video series, consider checking out my book, Memorable Neurology, or subscribing to the channel. Good luck in your studies.